Welcome to Ask the Accountant, the podcast that is made for you. Weekly podcast live Mondays from 8.30 a.m., released on the podcast service of your choice on Wednesdays. Your main weekly hosts, Aaron Patrick and Johan Gary. Got something to ask? Submit your questions below or ask during the show. Podcast loading. We are currently getting everything set up behind the scenes. So sit back, relax, and we will be with you in a few seconds. Enjoy. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Ask the Accountant. Uh, as always, we are here at 8.30 a.m. on a Monday morning, myself and my co-host, Alan Patrick, to bring to you the latest news, insights and thoughts on the accounting industry. Aaron, how are you and how was your weekend? Hello, everybody. Yeah, good, thank you, Aaron. Good, thank you. It was a, a lovely, sunny weekend, just, you know, enjoying all of that sunshine. We went for a nice little walk with the dog. Again, sunshine, um, glorious sunshine, I'd like to say. So I assume for you it was lovely sunshine as well, was it not? I was promised F1 to start with. That cancelled. Then... I was promised it's all right. You'll be able to spend the whole weekend out in the garden enjoying it because it's we're in for nice weather. And all we got was Sunshine. overcast, <laughs> grey, drizzle, and rain. It was grim, and it still is grim. I'm just looking out my window now. It's still equally grim. Um, so yeah, I not a sunny weekend. We weren't as lucky as you, Aaron. Um, but yeah, we someone's got to have the sunshine at some point, I suppose. Even Derby. Mm-hmm. I mean, we were very close to saying the B word, very, very close. But we thought, you know what? It's not fair on everyone else. Like, if we were to say it, it, would, it would, it's instantly would be thunderstorm. So we thought, you know, we'll let everyone have a bit of sunshine. And um, but yeah, I can't promise that for the rest of the uh, rest of the week. And, and in fact, it's Bank Holiday weekend next weekend, isn't it? So it'd be it really is fun. another sure. one because we've not had enough of those, have we? Oh, I know, I know, I know. Looking forward to June and July when we don't do bank holidays. It's all a lot less hassle. <laughs> Um, right, well, before we get into the news, let's say good morning to some of the people in the group. As always, Mr. Paul Whitehouse is in the group chats. Um, we've got a LinkedIn user saying morning. Kirsty is saying morning all. Good morning, Kirsty. Another LinkedIn user saying good morning with a sunny face, I think. Uh, hopefully it's sunnier where you are. Uh, morning, Merlin. And Paul had a lovely weekend with nice weather down south as well. I've got a uh, friend who lives down in Hastings and they were having the time of their lives this weekend on the beach, enjoying the sun. I wasn't jealous and bitter at all. (laughs) Um, But yes, so moving on from the weather, but I suppose every now and then it's nice to remind everyone that this is a British podcast podcast where we discuss British topics like the weather. We could have a whole podcast on just weather if we wanted to, couldn't we? I mean, we could. I don't think it would be as insightful and as enjoyable as a whole topic, as a whole podcast on AI, for example, um, which I've been playing with again this week. And tell you what, AI can sell. (laughs) I've had uh, AI redo a load of my emails, uh, email templates that we use. And it's rewritten, one of the emails it's rewritten is um, our proposal email, which goes out with our letter of engagement and stuff. That's a snazzy bit of kit. I I was well impressed. I've been showing everyone it. It's like, look at this. We did it in seconds. Um, Is it it the Microsoft one or which one? So this is a app on my iPad called AI chat, which is powered by chat GTP free, I believe. Um, So yeah, so it doesn't understand anything post 2021. Although did I see rumors in the media that they might be letting it look at the internet again soon? Um, But apparently Bing has no issue, uh, not Bing. So because Bing looks at um, no, Bing, Bing has full access. That's why Bing has that little advantage. It has full access to current internet. Which one's the one Google's launched? Oh, um, yeah, some weird name. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> Google's remember. got access, and Google apparently can do a very good blog on 
uh, the latest tax affairs and the latest budget or statement from the government, from what I'm told. Ooh. Which chat GTP 3 and 4 can't do because it's not got access to an, a current enough data. So I think that's forcing them to have to turn it back on again. Um, but anyway, before we go into that whole AI conversation, we, that's not the topics of today. Um, <laughs> Kirsty's just put in the comments, uh, if you need some sunshine, Johan, try watching Selling Sunset with a bit of LA sunshine. Very nice. Um, yeah. Bard, Bard is a good well one. There we go. Yeah. Google Bard. Thank you, Kirsty and LinkedIn users. Yeah, Google Bard. I, I went to try and play with it, but my it's not activated on my account or something. Um, so I, I went back to the 1990s and just used chat GTP. Um, but hey-ho, we can't all have everything, can we? Um, I yeah. do recommend the Bing one, though. Like I've been using that for a long, long time now, and I, yeah, I'm blown away with how good it is. Okay, I'm going to have to try the Bing. I, I just... When did you last go? Oh, I'll check Bing. I'll ask Bing. Well, this is it. This is made right. it relevant. It's again. all been Google for the last ten years. So to suddenly have to use the word Bing, we went from Ask Jeeves to Google. And never looked back, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> oh, ask Jeeves, AI powered Ask Jeeves. How cool would that be? <laughs> the ultimate butler. <laughs> um, but yeah, so yeah, I've been playing with AI and had a great time this week. Uh, redoing email templates. It's amazing how quick it does it and to what quality. Um, it does go on a bit though, a bit like me. So at least it, it sounds even more natural that it's coming from me. <laughs> um, but yeah, right. Um, let's talk about actual news in the world of accounting, shall we, Aaron? So first of all, we've got a product release. Who'd have thought it? I'm the timing's confusing me, if I'm honest. I'd have thought they would have announced this, what, two weeks ago at Accountex? And I went to their stand and they didn't utter a word about it. So Really? Not a whisper. Um, but yeah, so uh, what are we talking about? So Dext has launched an expense product, basically. So you can give every one of your team members access to a basically a new user type on Dext where they can have a login, click a, uh, take a picture of a receipt, which adds it to their personal expense claim for that week, month, period, whatever it is. It's got all the OCR technology, but also in uploading it, they explain what, they, what it was for and who potentially had pre-authorized the expense. Um, so yeah, it, nice little feature. I think it brings Dex back into relevance for expense management in the bigger companies potentially, where it, it's a competitive space. And I think because Dex had that credit card prepaid card thing, didn't they, from Capital on Tap at one point, which was going to be, but it, it was maybe five years too soon, or three or four years too soon, maybe. Um, so they dropped it, but yeah. Aaron, have you looked at this? Have you got any thoughts on it? I haven't looked at it um, for the simple reason that I I don't use Dext as much as I should do. Um, I know how powerful it can be, but I'm still stubborn and <laughs> still in the receipt <laughs> receipt bank days where, yeah, where a few bridge, bridges were burnt back then, put it that way. Um, so I wasn't aware of this. My concern for it is that when we went to see their last product update or product release, which was their, you know, quote unquote bookkeeping solution, um, I wasn't impressed at all. And I felt like if that's, you know, if that's the future of what their new products are going to look like, um, I'm out. It, it was my initial reaction to it. I hope that they've been able to do a better expense management solution than QuickBooks Advance was because that was uh, ropey at best. So, as good as QuickBooks Advance was and as good as um, we really like the product, their expense solution was, you know, completely and utterly missed the point, in my opinion. And and so I, I, I think, and for what you've already said there, it sounds like they've got enough substance there to be at least be better than that, which was a very low bar. Um, so that seems absolutely, you know, what, what we need, what we need. But I still, 
I don't know. Expense management to me is one of those where either you just grin and bear it and it's Excel sheets or paper or whatever you're going to do and it, you know, you just send it in. Or what I like to use is on, you know, directly with the payroll. So if I've got expense management and it's connected directly to the payroll, we use QuickBooks Advance um, payroll. Um, it works beautifully. Like my staff can claim an expense on their mobile phone and it just flows through nicely. That to me is where I see expense management should really be living. It should be within the payroll solution. It should be there. Um, but if, if Dex can find a way to make this, you know, maybe work with someone like Cresco or someone like that, where they can actually make it so you can actually, you know, reimburse your staff quicker and easier. It doesn't have to go through payroll. That I could be interested in and could be more, more beneficial to us. Um, and again, for, for the, you know, for clients, if they had that feature where, you know, expense management could be done outside of payroll, again, maybe more more interested and more excited about that but has it does it look like it's got that sort of features does it look like that's where it's going with it or is it just standard expense management solution a few reports and add it to payroll if you wish sort of idea yeah it's standard dext i suppose it's it's taking that ocr technology and reading that receipt which without being rude to quickbooks top trumps quickbooks because they haven't got the ability to read the receipts so the level of competence that Dex does. But actually, I was just thinking there, what you're saying is what makes the perfect expense solution is OCR technology to read the receipt, followed by an easy way to do payments, which in the form of Cresco. Now, you've got two solutions here. One is you use something like Plio or Solido, Soldo, Solidio, whatever they're called. Yeah. Yeah. Um, where mean? you give a prepaid card um, and the team member uses that. That's what we use in our firm. Um, so we use Plio and it works fine. Um, but there's not great OCR technology behind it. So team members are still having to spend time plugging in what things were. Now I'm still having to categorize. Um, but the... The other solution that I've just thought of is concerning Apron. Yes. So we know Apron's got great OCR technology because it's already picking out bank details from invoices. We know it's got payment solutions because it's that's what it's there for. Does that mean actually Apron are set? So if you don't want the pre -card, prepaid card solution, actually, do we think Apron could storm the industry with an expense app so your employees yeah. go out take pictures of receipts aprons ocr is really powerful it could do it could read that data and then it uses their payment platform to then deliver the payments which you get notified of and you authorize and do we could we go one step further that and use their approval solution and in some circumstances we don't need to do expense reimbursement we could just approve to be paid directly from how, you know, things like exam fees or hotel bookings or something where they don't need to be straight away. It's not that they've already had to make that payment there and then, you know, it, if it was a case they had to get approval before they could make a, a, a tapped pay or something like that would be, that would be ludicrous. Right. But if it's, if they could wait a half an hour or so for it to go through, for that approval to come through, that could be quite powerful as well. Couldn't it? And, and let's turn it on the head. It's not just purely reimburse expenses but actually let's let's let them pay directly from our 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 funds but with an approval solution yeah i uh yeah i think that could be a solution so apron if you're out there um you know you know where we are or cresco, we if cresco wants to add ocr <laughs> yeah cresco if you've got ocr you know where we are we take checks for these ideas um bounty bars for aaron Mars bars for me. <laughs> We're not overly expensive. Road vouchers if you really want to push it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Road vouchers would come in very handy. That is a, uh, yeah, that's an expensive hobby we're getting into there. <laughs> um, but it's all right because the delay on road products coming into the UK at the moment is so high that we've got time to make savings. Um, right. So, um, yeah, so that was the news, really, of Dex has launched an expense management platform. It's like, 
it's okay. I think it's better than someone having to sit and fill out a spreadsheet, attach images and submit that. I think it's a step yeah. in the right direction. But yeah, I think what we've just discovered there is potentially a dream solution with Apron or you know, Kresko if they had OCR type things. So um, question so... to you regarding Dex then. With their um, bookkeeping solution or whatever they're calling it. And now they're expensive. The MCD it's a one. Yeah, yeah. And now they're expense solution are they starting to build out and we now have to call it an fms financial management solution uh, although i hate that term <laughs> are they starting to build out the core components for a full-blown dext bookkeeping dex qbo dex zero whatever they want to call it is that their next their next play is this i don't know i think they're I don't know if they know what their direction is right now. I think they might be a bit lost. That's the feel I get from these random releases. Um, yeah, you know, personally, I think the expense market is completely and utterly. I think the pain points over exaggerated. I don't think there's as much money in that market as they think there is in the UK. In the US, it seems to be a very different market space. Mm -hmm. But in the UK, I don't think it's as big a problem as people. You know, these softwares like us to believe it is. Um, but yeah, the expense management. When I think expense management, I'm thinking people like in big firms, big companies. So you're going, decks are going right. Here's OCR for tech, for bookkeepers and accountants and businesses that are doing their own internal stuff. Then they're going and talking to your local decorator and bricky and plumber and electrician for MTD Itza and then they're going straight back to talking to our you know your, the big businesses that need expense claims it's a bit jarring very different markets and I'm not convinced they know where they want to play at the moment yeah yeah we've had some updates in chat haven't we uh yep. Roz has so, joined us hello morning Roz. Roz. nice to see you always a pleasure uh LinkedIn user I need to jump on a call this content of the podcast is very interesting it's the record available here it certainly is. It goes live on a Wednesday at five o'clock, six o'clock on the podcast service of your choice, or just watch any of the platforms we've got. In fact, if you're sat here watching Johan's um, LinkedIn, then as soon as it finishes, it'll be available on demand when you need yep. it. Uh, Kirsty says, had a play with Apron, loved the re reading bank feature. Making the payment by Santander was a bit awkward, not so slick. We'll keep trying. Have you had any other issues with like that one? So these payment problems aren't Apron's fault. It's in the same way Cresco are having problems with bulk payments. It is the banks. The government brought in legislation for open banking. The mission of open banking was to deliver the same standards of features and usability across all banks in the UK. It has failed miserably because no, none of the banks are quite doing what I mean Metro Bank's not even turned the bloody thing on it's a legal requirement and what's happening to Metro Bank nothing really so yeah it's um it's a challenge for any software provider because of consistency you know like if you're using some of the high street banks then Cresco can deliver standing orders it can deliver bulk payments but then if you're using Starling Bank or any of the main challenger banks they can't do that. And this is our biggest headache as a firm is we want to spin off a service, but it's got to be delivering a service that is deliverable to not necessarily all, but the majority of our clients. Exactly. And when you're trying to encourage a client to use a new service, you don't want to be stopped every two minutes by, oh, hang on, what bank are you with? Does it work? Does this bit work? Does that bit work? It's just not good enough from the bank's point of view. Um but yeah, if you're using Santander, Santander is not an overly intuitive payment experience. Uh, you need codes and remember the 8th, 10th and 1st character of your password. And now I'm going to send you a six digit code. And yeah, it's, it's not great. Um, whereas I have used Apron's payment facility to send about 15 Payments all in one go via Starling, no problems at all. I mean, same with Revolut. I've got video on it. <laughs> worked beautifully. Yeah, one one problem. Starling flagged flagged it as fraud because of the size of the amount of money going out. But 
you know that that's fine. That's that's Starling doing yeah. their job and going. Mm, that's yeah, a bit that's of a large that's amount of money that you've never sent to someone before. Yeah. Um, so that's fine. I was happy with that. Um, but yeah, um, Roz said scanning to bookkeeping software as an expense and approving on Apron to pay. Love that idea. Yeah, I think it's a great solution, Roz. We're really impressed with Apron so far, um, and it seems to be. Fixing the problem for a larger part of our client base than we have managed to find a solution to so far. Um, then we've got a LinkedIn user saying, thanks, chaps. Have a wonderful week. And to you, Mr. Le or Mrs. LinkedIn user. Um, Kirsty says, yep, blaming Santander. Free when I set up 15 years ago. Yeah. But Typical accountant, that, isn't it? Typical accountant response. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, and Paul also agrees the banks are really dragging their feet on tech and open banking. I just think it's ridiculous that we've brought in legislation to bring the standards of banking up to a certain point and no one's enforcing it. Like, I mean, we're better than we were. When think back when open banking first came out and we had that whole you know rigmarole of was it Lloyd's where you had to send a paper <laughs> authorization over to yeah. the print outside this, send it over again. Um, and pre that back to your point about having to know all the codes and stuff that used to be a daily occurrence or weekly or monthly occurrence for clients actually going in getting their little scanning thing in and putting the numbers in and it still is so we, we progressed to a point but yeah we're just not there yet are we yeah exactly so yeah open banking is part of the headache for software providers at the moment to say the least um, but yeah uh, right okay let's move on speaking of banking <laughs> and legislation and all of that good stuff. I love these little tangents. They're fantastic. So, segways. Segways, that's the one. Um, so, let's segue into cryptocurrency. And you may have seen there's an, a report out from the government. It wasn't very favorable for cryptocurrencies, was it? Um, so, if you've not seen this report, basically a group of MPs have now uh, delivered a report on their opinions of cryptocurrency. To say it was condemning and damning was a, an understatement. Basically, they have recommended that cryptocurrency that's not backed by certain financial bodies should be deemed as gambling. So by investing in Bitcoin, you're not investing in a stock or anything like that. You are gambling your money. Um, so yeah, it, an interesting point of view. I mean, you and I were saying off air, Aaron, you know, this was at the UK government's opportunity to be quite forward thinking and, you know, potentially, yes, make some legislation to make sure that what we've seen in the last nine months doesn't happen again or as severely, but it was an opportunity to, to embrace a change um and yeah they, they have <laughs> they have not gone down that route at all have they uh they have basically said anyone that's investing in crypto is a gambler it should be deemed as gambling it should be subject to all the same rules and regulations as any gambling uh whether that's stocks and shares on apps whether that's going to the local betting shop and placing money on a horse Whatever it is, that is what they've deemed it as being. Um, yeah. Thoughts on this, Aaron? Well, I mean, first of all, quick off the mark, aren't they, government? I mean, like, when were we talking about crypto? Uh, you know, I mean, we even turned up to a Countex and there was no crypto or very few crypto uh, uh, apps being showcased, was there? You know, whereas the year before, every Everyone. other stand was crypto related, right? Yeah. So to say that crypto has fallen off the radar and is not quite that hot topic anymore is an understatement, right? Um, <laughs> but you know, government being the government, they're quick off the mark, quote unquote, uh, to come up with with their their thing. And and of course it was gambling. Like that that was obvious, right? That was an obvious point of point of contention. Like the the fact it wasn't regulated, the fact that you know we, we could see these big gains and we knew at some point that was going to crash at, at any point. I think. Everyone knew it was it was um, gambling, and and like we've already said, like you've already mentioned, the only opportunity I thought from this was a chance for us to 
be a little bit different and, and approach it in a different way and have a chance to, you know, maybe adopt it in some form. But yeah, that's never going to happen. And like I think uh, Kimberly's just said here, with the fact that they're classing it as gambling, does that mean that that means it's completely tax free and we shouldn't have to worry about including on a tax return going forward? I mean, that's actually an interesting thought, though, isn't it? Because originally they were all talking, government and HMRC wanted to know crypto gains because they thought, huh, taxability, there's capital gains here, we'll tax that. But now, I suppose, now they've seen what's happened in the last nine months, are they now thinking, actually, you're more likely to lose money than gain it? And we don't want you offsetting that loss as a capital gains loss against other yep. profits because that's going to reduce our our taxable income. So actually, for that reason, by making it gambling, we're, it's probably saving us money rather than making us uh, losing us money at the moment. Um, so, yeah, an interesting, interesting to keep an eye on this going forward, I think. Um, yeah. And. You know, when I was reading the articles about this, it didn't look like they really called very many witnesses. I mean, the government has the power to call anyone they want as a witness to these panels to help educate and inform the outcome of the report. And I think they just went off the media hype and said, no, this is gambling. It's all wrong. It's, until it's re Unless it's regulated, we can't do anything about it. Uh, move on. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it was very much a case that they were forced to, to do something and talk about it. They didn't want to at all. They didn't want to be involved, did they? Let's be honest. Like, it's too messy for them to get involved. There's, even if they wanted to clamp down on it, they, they they didn't really have the power to do that, did they? Let's be honest. It's so unregulated that there is no way that everyone has been recording their crypto gains that have happened in the past. They may, they may, may have more incentive now that there are losses. You're right. Maybe that's why suddenly they've had this this let's let's change the legislation let's make it different let's make it so that they can't claim those losses because i imagine people are going to be more incentivized to claim that loss that could be offset against something else and they would have done you know first time in their life having to do a tax return and, and, and put it through so yeah, yeah I mean, you can kind of sold your property for a hundred thousand but you've lost 50k in crypto then of course you want to offset that makes sense then doesn't it yeah exactly yeah. so um, but yeah. what we should make very clear at this point is that this is just a report from a team, from a group of it, of MPs. It is not change of legislation. The report could influence the change of legislation going forwards. But as of this moment in time, we continue reporting crypto losses and gains as capital losses and gains um, until something is announced later on. Uh, just yeah, very which, clear before we get based done. on the timeline we've got now i'd say 2028 or is that too ambitious i will hmrc have built a computer that can plug into the internet by then <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah um so yeah paul's just commented as well in the comments that's interesting timing does this mean i need we should be changing our approach for capital gains potentially but I, as i say paul it's just a report i think it indicates the direction we could expect them to take uh, but until then, and until they tell us when that rules, those rules come in to force, treat it as you go, uh, as you do today. There's no change in the way we treat it at the moment. Well, um, don't be shocked if they do. Yes, don't be shocked if they do. Plan ahead. Um, another nice little segue there. So HMRC being inadequate and useless, um, the uh, HMRC out to help us accountants and bookkeepers even more and to do that they're going to close down the regist VAT registration helpline I don't know about you Aaron but I've lost count the amount of VAT registrations we've put in in the last 12 months where we've actually had to phone them to say uh did, did you process this you've not you've not sent any mail out like we're still chasing a VAT registration from July 2022 like yet yeah, they're going to close down the helpline so they can put more staff, allegedly, into the processing of registrations. Um, yeah. I, it's just HMRC all over, isn't it? It's getting closed. Everything's getting closed down. God forbid you want direct contact. Um, yeah. I, what else can we say? What are your thoughts, Aaron? 
I think what's frustrating me about this one is, again, it's all about timing, isn't it? <clears throat> so HMRC has got this big clamp down on uh, e-commerce platforms, your Ebays, your Amazons, and all that sort of stuff. And they, they've they done this whole, well, you know, it's joint libel now. So if someone sells on the eBay platform or Amazon or whatever it's going to be, uh, technically eBay and Amazon are now have the have the potential of being jointly liable for that VAT. So obviously these platforms are then really nervous now and they're really scared. So one of the problems we've had a lot of our clients at the moment is that the 85,000 threshold that most people are working towards and most people kind of understand and they get grips with and they can figure out and plan accordingly if they need to, well, that doesn't apply to these online services, these marketplaces. So what we've got is a lot of clients who are, you know, not at 85,000. Maybe they're, you know, maybe eBay's got a bit nervous and at 60,000 they've capped them and they've said that. And what they do with these marketplaces, they will refuse and, and stop you selling on those platforms until you apply that VAT number. So in our case, you know, in the will of the world, the best, best, you know, best tax planning you can do and everything else, most of the time with VAT, you can kind of slowly get to that number maybe get you know get a little bit close to it maybe you know just in time you'll you'll go and get that application no 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 back in mind it probably take 30 days or so to go through absolutely fine um but now it's very much reacting all the time because ebay or amazon have, have stopped them from selling on these platforms so then we've got to go and get that registration in sooner or later and that's where most of our issues lie with the VAT registration at the moment because sometimes it could be 90 days to get get done you know and that's 90 days of a client not being able to actually sell that is a huge huge issue um and they're jumping on social media and they're putting backlash on and blaming their accountant and everything else that goes with it because of the fact that it's in an absolute mess so if they know that there's this whole you know problem with the registration at the moment there's issues and, and everything else and how can they then decide that like, logically let's get rid of one of the only helplines we're actually utilizing at the moment and we're actually you know properly having to having to having to you uh, use it just just timing yet again isn't it i think their argument is that they've got this fancy new portal solution where you can upload stuff to and all that stuff but it doesn't work does it let's be honest it's not actually doing what it needs to do um so whatever it'll just mean we're going to clog up the the normal vat line now aren't we and it'll be even more of a a delay on getting those sort of answers going forward. Yeah, definitely. It's um, and you're right that the online software uh, things are a nightmare because uh, I've got a client that's got sixty six pounds worth of YouTube revenue, and all their monetization stuff's been turned off until they produce all these documents. But then you send documents to YouTube, and because they're a US based company with US based staff, I haven't got a clue what any of the UK documents mean or look like. And then they challenge you on whether they're the right documents. And it's like, well, of course they're the right documents. I'm telling you the right documents. Like, yeah, it, you know, like we've got a client who uses Shopify. Trundling along, absolutely fine. VAT registration's all there. They've now decided, actually, we need to check you're a genuine company. So instead of going onto company's house to check the registration, they want letters from us, proof of accounts, all of this other stuff. Well, they want proof of accounts, yet they're less than a year old. Is that, um, <laughs> um, yeah, right. You've got the VAT registration, you've got everything else. And they've, they've stopped all revenue going to him. So he can still make his sales and he's still sending out products, but he's not making, none of that revenue has been deposited to him until this is ma matters resolved. And he still has to pay his fees, I assume, to the platform. It's still got to pay all the, yeah. Like, and you're just like, how? That's his only payment gateway. All of his money in has now stopped because they are now trying to police it because HMRC have told them they've got to. And they haven't got a clue what they're trying to police. So, yeah, absolute nightmare. Um, but, you know, we've got, as I say, we've got VAT registrations. We literally just got an answer this week, uh, last week regarding one that was made in October last year that we've chased and chased. That company's actually gone and changed its legal structure since. So it went from a partnership when it registered. It's now got to the point where actually they're better off being a limited company. But we couldn't do that until the partnership VAT return was finalised. 
so that we can then transfer it. It's just a nightmare. And HMRC closing these helplines isn't helping anybody. Like, apart from themselves, require less staffing, allegedly. But yeah. Right. After that rant, <laughs> uh, what have we got coming in on the comments? So uh, Kimberly is in agreement with us. It's a very true and a total nightmare. Peter has said uh, HMRC equals I'm not here at the moment. Please leave a message after the beep, but then forget to turn the beep on. Um, and Paul said he's got a couple of VAT transfers for individuals who went limited. God knows how we're going to solve that without being able to call HMRC. Yeah, it's... VAT yeah. transfers are an absolute nightmare. Like during COVID, I think I waited two years for VAT transfer to be rejected. Yeah, most of the time we just say, look, what's the benefit of it? Let's just start set up a new scheme. It's just, yeah, yeah it's become... deregister and start again. Yeah, exactly. And that shouldn't be the answer. That should not be the, you know, the, the way we, we advise our clients. But sometimes we've got to go, well, it may not be the most tax efficient or it may not be the most beneficial from an admin point of view. But trust us, like if you, if you want to transfer your VAT return, you could have a, a period of just inactivity if you're not careful. So, yeah, definitely. So, uh, no nice segue to this one, unfortunately. Um, but our next topic is Zero launched their financial year end results last week. Now, software financial results isn't something we're overly interested in normally, is it, Aaron? We wouldn't normally go, oh, hello, let's go and have a look at this. But I think. We've had billions of them in this time, man. <laughs> so, That's what we would be talking about, right? right? Say again, sorry. Normally, we'll be talking about how many billions they've made from us, uh, <laughs> oh. us paying their software fees this time, man. Yeah. Um, but yeah, in this case, we wanted to look at the zero and we wanted to chat about it, didn't we? The zero financial results, because the impression is that they've, they've perhaps been a bit tight on cash recently, you know. 800 redundancies. Um, the zero con has gone to one event in the world a year. Um, I would argue they, I don't think they were any smaller at account X this year, but I don't think they were as flamboyant and in your face yeah. as they have been in previous years. Um, so yeah, so we thought we'd have a look at the financial year end results for zero. Um, and as you might expect whoever wrote this report and the speech that the ceo gave would do very well in politics like they got they've got a spin doctor in there um question or did they just throw it through an ai generator <laughs> Bob question is, here are our financial results make these sound positive yeah. <laughs> please at which point Chat GTP has given out a huge mammoth report and they've gone the other day. Because <laughs> that was, you haven't got any, they haven't got enough staff now to actually write the report. Oh, they use Swift, didn't they? It is Swift, isn't it? Their little AI generated report thing. Oh, is it? Uh, yeah, yeah Swift, got an Swift AI. analytics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, lots and lots of positive stuff. Um, so, operating revenue increased 28% globally this is so you know uh, how much of that's just price increases All because we saw that. some of those in the last year um i mean the real even this number is a bit suspect in any soft I'm, i should point out my speculation here is all software providers not just zero but they're saying total number of subscribers is increased by four hundred seventy thousand across the globe but we were saying off air that that could just be 47,000 accountants buying 100 licenses each and not populating them with any client information. Like that's, it's not a true measure of how many active live businesses are using their software. Yeah. Uh, and the same, that same concept goes to all software providers in the accounting industry. They're very good at saying how many subscribers they've got, which, but it's not actually how many live subscribers they've got. It's just how many licenses they have that are active yeah. whether they are populated with live businesses or not is a different matter yeah exactly and i remember as well zero go got released so how yeah. many of that four four hundred and seventy thousand are people just downloading zero go to have a go with it because i 
I free. imagine everyone would have had a look at look and see what it is. It was free, right? So yeah. why wouldn't you have a go? Because <laughs> it's free, you've not cancelled it. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, but you know, is is that reflective? It's it's, it's difficult to difficult to say. But three point seven four million does seem like a healthy starting point, though. You or, or you know subscriber basis that's what they're up to isn't it so that should be a positive take on their on their yeah. Um, results yeah i mean then you know you go through the rest and gross margin remained flat to 87.3 um ebitda increased but let's face it we all know what we can make all sorts of things happen with an ebitda can't we um yeah i wouldn't measure anyone on an ebitda um Operating in- income grew by 61%. Um, interestingly, uh, the net loss <laughs> grew. So the net loss went from 113 million, uh, sorry, went from 7 million U- uh, New Zealand dollars to 113 million New Zealand dollars. Uh, that probably explains why they've suddenly had to make some redundancies. Like, if you're going to add 104 million US, uh, New Zealand dollars lost to your on your performance, then yeah, you, you need to start making some savings. Um, so yeah, it, uh, anything to glean from it? Well, what's missing there for me is like, surely if they want to put a positive spin on this, surely they should be talking about their R and D push, yep. like. Where's the mention of that? And and that was our worry, wasn't it? Like when they started talking about redundancies, when they started talking about um, reducing and everything else, our first initial point was, okay, so what does that mean for future enhancements? Because, you know, for me, if you're going to start cutting costs and, 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 you know, starting to absorb it and starting to, you know, really close it down, then to me that means you've kind of built your solution and you're, it's out the door and all you're then going to do is just maintain it. Whereas in, in this industry, what we're going through at the moment, we need to see, you know, it, it's for our benefit selfishly as accountants and, and for our clients, it's for our benefit to see zero sage quick books, just absolutely go for it lever and keep innovating every single year. You know, that's what we need from the industry. Right. And yeah. When you look at these financial results here, they don't mention anything about R and D or what they what they're looking to bring in. I mean, maybe maybe they have a different take on it, but for me, gross margin, I would expect within the gross margin, within that that um, cost of the you know cost of sales, should be some form of development cost, and there should be that element there. And if eighty seven percent of their gross margin, you know, profit mar- or if their gross profit is eighty seven percent. Um, so how much development they're putting in there doesn't sound like a lot, does it? You know, I mean, it's, it's quite cheap just to re to change formats of font in a uh, report, isn't it? I suppose, yeah, release a new reporting feature, yeah, exactly. Or, is it, I mean, Zero Go can't have been an expensive, uh, maybe I'm completely wrong here, but in comparison to QuickBooks Avant or uh, QuickBooks accounts production software or you know, whatever it's going to be. The, it's got to, you know, that's got to be um, one of the issues. And that, you know, in fairness to them, and, and this is where HMRC have got to kind of see, have uh, got to take some responsibility. Some of their development costs will have gone down to MTD, it's, uh, and that would not have been an insignificant amount, right? So, yeah. which is why Zero Go got, and maybe that is kind of part and parcel of their Zero Go development costs being put through. So, you know, and they've been burnt by that. So the you know, the the fact of the matter is, HMRC are now going to have to really beg and borrow for for software providers to get more, you know, to get involved in MTD. It's so going forward. <clears throat> so maybe some of it is that they've plowed all or a load of development into MTD. It's so that's now not going to come to fruition, and that's why they've got nothing else to show for it. But we need something from them. We need to see something. We had. Um, uh ryan didn't we on for we have yep. cool friends and he you know it was perfect timing for us because quickbooks advance just got announced at the um or re-announced or re-talked about at the quickbooks connect um 
and, and talked about there. But his biggest fear was that, well, nothing is, there's no even murmurings of that sort of going up, up the chain with zero to, you know, bigger yeah. clients or bigger, bigger businesses. Um, and that's kind of where they need to be now. They need to start repositioning and looking upwards, don't they? Um, but with these sort of numbers, it doesn't look like they'll have that opportunity. I mean, it doesn't seem it. And definitely there'll be no room for acquisitions based on that as well, will they? That's not something that's going to be viable for them. Well, that, and if you're if you're a capital investor and you're giving money to zero to do stuff, if you look at how many of their acquisitions they've actually closed down in the last few years because they were dead ducks, like, yeah, it doesn't fill you with confidence, does it, as an investor? Um, but, yeah, so I think overall the outcome is that, yeah, they're, that perhaps they're not doing as financially well as we you'd hope they would be, and that's potentially why we are seeing the changes that we're seeing. Um, so I'm just looking at the comments quickly, and Paul was asked if there any comments on the roadshows, spoke to Zero at Countex. They said they told me they were going to do some roadshows. Also noticed QuickBooks have started to announce QuickBooks Connect again. Um, so, yeah, so QuickBooks have got two roadshow type things going on in the Midlands kind of area this year. Um, Manchester folk, <laughs> they're not going to be happy. Further north, then. <laughs> the problem is, they call it the north, and I live in Edinburgh. That's, and even that's not north. Like when you look at how far north of Scotland you can go. Um, but yeah, so my issue with zero roadshows has always been it's sell, sell, sell sell the zero product, justify why you should only be using zero products, etc. Whereas when I go to free agent roadshows or QuickBooks roadshows, um, I've been to uh, modular roadshows, all sorts. And it's been very much a, this is who we are, this is what we do. Now that has put you in front of some experts that A, will teach you how to use the product, but B, will teach you about insights to the industry and stuff. That is very informative type things. Um, but when you go to zero, it's just like the last zero roadshow I went to in Edinburgh. So it was only a 10 minute walk for me to get to it. I walked out at 11 o'clock because I saw the whole agenda and it was just there. Uh, basically why you should only be using zero and you should have your whole practice and every client using pay zero payroll, which is no <laughs> zero expenses, zero projects. <laughs> and it's just like, I'm not, I'm not going to spend my day being sold to. I will come and I don't mind being sold to a little bit, but I want to be, I want to be coming to these events and being educated. Yeah. So zero didn't have any special guests or anything. All, whereas you go to free agent, they're bringing in accountants that are using the product and talking about the latest trends. You go to QuickBooks, they're bringing in accountants and they're talking about the latest trends. They're bringing in, in motivational speakers, etc. You know, and when they get desperate, they ask Aaron to turn up. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, they've not asked me, but they know my thoughts on going to Manchester. So. <laughs> Uh, when you have to ch tackle Trans Pennine Express trains to get anywhere, it's just a non-starter for me, really. Um, but yeah, and as Ross says, anything north of Watford is north for her. Um, yeah, it's an, it's an interesting perception of what's north, isn't it? Uh, I suppose anyone in Brighton thinks everything's north. Um, but yeah, so yeah, I, I've not heard anything about zero roadshows going on. Have you seen anything, Aaron? No, but it comes back to it, right? Like, the hard sell for me, I don't mind being sold a product, or at least the perception be sold a product if it's some new fancy new piece of development. Like, and it could be anything, right? If they're coming at me on all the talking, it could be anything. It, could, it doesn't matter really. As long <laughs> if as it's, it's shiny, I'm interested, it's right? <laughs> <laughs> I watch YouTube videos. I'll, 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 I'll do it all. But, but that's that to me is where these roadshows should be aimed at. It's right. What's new in the product? You, did, you weren't interested in this last year. Why should you be interested in this year? Well, we've got X, Y, Z. Um, and, and you know, that's where Zero probably are nervous about doing those sort of things. Like, what do they talk about? Oh, we'll be ready for MTD, it's a... Um, <laughs> okay. You know, oh, we've had this new report feature. Mm, again, yeah. 
it, it's, it's difficult, isn't it? And, and like we said, like we need them to be innovating. We need them to be pushing those boundaries because innovation just breeds that whole opportunity for us and competition to, to better the, the other products. So I think my final parts on there, you know, I think it, at least it gives you confidence that they're not going anywhere. That doesn't seem like that's the issue. We don't seem like that's going to be a problem. And that's, that is what we need here. Like you don't want to have people being nervous around using the software and nervous recommending the software and nervous for the clients who are on the software. So not going anywhere. That's good. But without the innovation, it just feels like they will be treading water. And I'm not sure treading water and look, look what happened with Sage when they just treaded water, right? They, yeah. they almost went out of uh, relevance at one point. So fingers crossed for them that they've, you know, this is just a, a slight blip for them and they can find ways of, of developing maybe maybe they need to borrow the client engager team to uh build some, we're build busy some products from quick <laughs> we're busy so um <laughs> although our job's getting i mean did you see center this week when uh, last week center went down four days out of five oh. like, it's now got to the point i think some center users you know how like when you're in someone's head office they've got like so many days or weeks or months for health and safety since we had an accident I think they've got like a minute clock as to how many minutes since we last broke. <laughs> um, Does that mean Iris ran out of coal then? Are they run out of coal in there? I mean, we did stop mining it in the 80s, didn't we? So, <laughs> yeah, the probably, reserves are probably a little low. <laughs> uh, <laughs> right, <laughs> now we're going to get sued for that. Let's move on. <laughs> um, oh, we've got one more from uh, Roz. Uh, I also want to see uh, innovators at your roadshows, Zero. With new products that innovate, both QB and Zero could do better on that. Very true. Yeah. We do. Yeah. We only really QuickBooks and Zero and Free Agent, to be fair to, which have a very small group of softwares that plug into them. But they only really give the space on these roadshows to large existing partners who probably already have the majority of the market. They don't bring in the the startups and the innovators like. We saw at uh, um, accountants, accountants this year where they've got startup zones and stuff. Um, yeah. And for me, yeah. like, I will always, always remember QuickBooks Roadshow um, 2018, was it? 2019, whichever one it was. Um, and they announced the Go Cardless um, integration. And I, I yelped. I was like, yes, come on. Like, that's the sort of thing they want to be talking about. And at, and at that point, Go Cardless were a, and nobody, no one knew who they were. They had no thing, you know, they were at the start of phase. Um, but that's what they want to be announcing, right? Like they want to be telling people, look at look at this partner we've got, look at what they've been able to do for you, uh, make your life easier, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, we can't say too much, but we know why uh, the partnership uh, relationships with QuickBooks aren't as what they should be. Um, but that's something that needs to be changed, both QuickBooks and Zero, yeah. and and even if that's what Zero came with, then like, look, Zero itself's not really innovated that much, or we've not got that much to talk about. But look what all our partners are doing. Like that would be enough to bring people in, right? And they could make it like an app roadshow almost. Like that could be a spin on them. <laughs> and they could even get those apps to pay for the roadshow itself. There we are. We can <laughs> solve both problems for you. But exactly. yeah, it's it's difficult, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and Paul said, yeah, he would love to see people like Katana, which I only found out about, about doing some research for a client, only to find out the client's already been using them for the past year. Oh, dear. <laughs> well, I suppose as a segue, isn't that what digital accounting show is all about? It is. I mean, I was going to use the segue of talking about Accountex. So oh, okay. <laughs> um, in our last piece for today, uh, we've only got a few minutes left, but... Accountex have launched uh, released their figures, and they reckon they had ten thousand two hundred and ninety five people attend Accountex over two days, which is a record for them. Which probably means it's the record for the UK accounting conference scheme uh, scene because that is the biggest event in the market. Um, so yeah, I mean, ten thousand two hundred ninety five. That is incredible amount of people. Um, and just, just and remember I, though we were six of those people <laughs> but it, still true. amazing numbers <laughs> um but yeah that, that that is a huge count and 
I think that shows how many people in the industry are actually getting out and looking at the future of the industry. Um, but then that pulls into question the validit- validity of other shows, shall we say? So, like, if Accountex London is knocking out 10, over 10,000 people, Accountex Manchester, I don't know what numbers they're expecting there. It's normally two to 3,000. It's a one-day event. Is it really that, ma- that many? Like... I think so. It's what they say on the website. Um, but then you look at Digital Accountancy Show later in a couple of weeks, 2,000 people. You look at Accounting Web, brand new uh, location in Birmingham, brand new uh, event hall, which is bigger. Can they fill it? Like Digital Accountancy Show, they've just moved to um, Battersby Power Station. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, that, it's a huge venue and they're very excited about it. It's just, are the numbers big enough for it at the moment? I don't know. And then as software providers, so like at Client Engager, we're sat here looking at all these events going, well, which one do we invest in? Because to do them all, you need to be one of the big players. Yes. Like to do them all, if you want to go to Accountex, Accountex North, uh, accounting web live, digital accountancy show. That's probably thirty thousand pounds before you even look at hotels, travel, food, drink, hospitality, branding, etc. That's just for your floor space. It it's a lot of money. And when I'm when you're sat there as a small accounting software, brand new startup or something, and you're looking at your budgets. Do the anyone else's numbers stack up to justify paying to go to anything else compared to a Countex? Possibly not, I would say. Um, but yeah, Aaron, what are your thoughts on those numbers, the relevance of other shows, etc.? I think absolutely phenomenal that ten thousand accountants going down, and that we we had a celebration show, didn't we, within this week with Ashley, and we. Uh, yeah. We, we, we spoke, and Caroline was there, who's part, part, part of the team for Accountex. Um, and I think it was you that rightly said that more than anything, it just shows that the industry is going in the right direction. You know, no one was sat there in ties. No one was, you know, um, shirt and ties. It was it was people wanting to further their bit practice, further their, you know, make it easier for their clients and improve their relationships with their clients and everything else. And it was such a good feeling and you know we weren't talking about mtd we were talking about proper you know elements that are going to really bring you pra- and when you look at some of the talks and stuff over there it was absolutely phenomenal but i think you're right i think the the other shows like this is a big year for digital accounting show a huge year for them they were that plucky underdog that you know had this really tight-knit um show which were brilliant we love the digital account show and they, they bring a few differences to it you know the lights go down and they try and you know they, they do something different right they, they've got their own brand and their own thing and we love it and we love it what they've done there but i think some of the charm was the fact it was that smaller arena where we could see all of them one of the things i loved about it was the fact that the your qbo's zeros and everything else had the same size stand as everyone else like it was a level playing field it's not how much money you could throw at it. It's about what you can bring to the table, what you can talk yeah. about. And I honestly, like the QuickBook stand in that one was all the way in the back. I only went to say hello to them. What I was interested in in the kind of show last year was talking to the rest of the ones, like people I've never heard of and yeah. having those sort of relationships and starting to talk with them and everything else. And that to me is what Digital Accounting Show brings. That's a special source for it. Um, I'll be completely honest. I'm a little bit skeptical about this big step for them. Um, only because we've seen some, whereas before they used to be really on the ball with, you know, how they treated you, making sure everything was right and everything else. They seem to have dropped a few eggs and, you know, there seems to be a few things not quite right this time around. And that's worrying at this stage. Um, you know, we, we always talk about for us, like when you, when you first set up a client, Make sure you get your name right. Make sure you, you're doing that sort of stuff right. That's ingrained to us as clients, right? As accountants, like first impressions mean a lot. And 
digital accounting show with them growing so much, they seem to have dropped that a little bit and they seem to be little, they're admin errors or admin issues, or whatever, right? Tiny little things, but people notice that and people remember that. And I feel like they, they need to be making sure that as they grow, they don't drop the balls and they don't have those little issues because that's what people remember it by. So fingers crossed for them that this next step is the right step for them and they're going in the right direction. I'm not 100% convinced on the location as well. If I'm, I love the fact that it's in a, you know, they've got this brand spanking new location, but there's only one tube line there and back. And there's no hotels around that area by the looks of it. So let's let's hope for hope for the best for them. But yeah, we'll we'll yeah. see. Um, it's a simple thing, though, be isn't it? Like, because they used to be at Twickenham. No, it didn't. Was that where they first? Tottenham got? Spurs. No, Spurs Stadium. Spurs. Tottenham yeah, Stadium, right. which yeah. was the most modern technical tech-focused stadium in the world at the time. And were they the first, like... First conference... Or one there. of the first ones yeah. to, to actually go there, weren't they? Yeah. Yeah. Not now, just in I always, space, but conference-wise. Yeah. And I always say, look, if when you're looking for premises for your accounting firm, make sure the premises suits your brand. Yeah. So if you're an older-fashioned accounting firm, absolutely fine. You can go into one of these old stone buildings with pillars and stuff. That's not an issue. But if you're one of these leading cloud-facing uh, firms, you probably want to be in a metal building, in a glass modern building, not a, a building next to the, the lawyer, lawyer's firm and with pillars and stone everywhere. And Tottenham's stadium suited the brand of digital accountancy show. Yeah, I almost think they're going backwards with the power station. Like, I don't in know fact, the story of the power station enough. Like, I've just got this been big old building. Hasn't it? Yeah. So and I've just got this big there. old building that is, you know, arcing back to eons gone by. And Iris coal times. And, yeah. <laughs> We've just had a joke about Iris having coal. So, yeah. So, yeah. And so... Yeah, I, I'm. I'm looking forward to going to the to actually learning what they're doing with that building now, and why yeah. it's relevant for the digital accountancy show to be there. Because I'm yeah. sure there is a relevance. I just don't know what it is yet. And and it's not just because it's bigger. Yeah. 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 Cool. Yeah. I think we've gone over time, haven't we? We have. Yeah. Right. Let's wrap the this up then. Uh, and thank you very much for everyone that's been interactive in the comments. Loads of comments coming in as always. If you've got any questions, make sure you stick it on the LinkedIn uh, link tree post link that has just gone out into all the comments. Um, and yeah, thank you very much for joining us. If you've missed this and you're listening back, uh, try and join us live every Monday morning at 8.30 on any of your favorite social media platforms. We are everywhere because we cluster bomb social media. Um, Aaron, anything coming up this week? Uh, relatively quiet week this week. Um, yeah, just <coughs> lots, lots of meetings. So for me, it's that calm before the storm because roadshow starts a week after, maybe I think it is. Um, yep. Then we've got digital accounting show. So yeah, it's all going to go mental from now on in. So yeah, I'm looking forward to having. Uh, there's a lot in the diary, but it's all sitting at you know sitting at the desk, getting it all done, uh, not having to do much traveling. So yeah, sounds good to me. What about yourself, Jan? Uh, yeah, no, I'm the same. I've we've just got a large project come in over the weekend from a client, so we need to crack on with that with short turnaround time. Um, I'm going to have to see some clients as well this week, which I'm looking forward to. And so yes, yeah, all fun and games. Um, but that's everything from us. So rather than take any more of your time on a Monday morning, we will say thank you and goodbye, and uh, join us next week when we will be going through the latest news and headlines for the accounting industry. So thank you very much.